Few species are as critical to rivers as salmon. They are the foundation of ecosystems, feed people around the world, and represent an important symbol for many cultures. The dynamic life history of salmon is one of Earth's great spectacles. Salmon lives culminate in an epic journey from the open ocean, past predators and obstacles, to the headwaters of coastal rivers where they spawn before dying. And right now, salmon habitat is changing. Glaciers are rapidly receding, uncovering rivers that haven't been ice-free in more than 10,000 years. So what does this mean for salmon? To answer this question, we're going to talk with Jonathan Moore, a professor at Simon Fraser University. Jonathan and his team have been studying how glacier recession affects salmon and the challenges that arise when new habitat emerges from under ice. Hey, John. How's it going? Good. It's nice to see you. Good to see you. It's been a bit. Thank you for doing this. Um, my pleasure. Yeah. And being part of my foray into YouTube videos. And your lab has a YouTube channel, actually, right? I think we do. Yeah, we, you, we, uh, we're not super active on it. but we, You do. Uh, you have a great video about beavers in the Arctic. So let's start with salmon. Mm. Why should people care about salmon? What got you interested in salmon? Yeah, I, I think salmon make these systems alive and they really sort of... Um, they they provide so many different benefits for people. So frankly, it's hard to articulate, but you go to one of these rivers that is filled with healthy salmon and you know there's eagles chittering and you might see bears and you see mink and also there's anglers there that are there to see them. And and then if you think back on time, you know, salmon really were foundational to the indigenous cultures that have been here for millennia. And so the the ties of salmon to these systems are deep and they run through cultures, they run through economies, and they run through ecosystems. Um, and salmon have pretty complex life histories. Yeah. So for the the viewer and the non-fish biologist ch chatting with you, do you want to give the, um, the Cliff's notes of how that works and why that might be relevant to what we're talking about today? Yeah, salmon have this amazing life cycle where they journey from the fresh waters where they're born out to the ocean and they you know, might range all the way over towards, you know, Alaska or Russia or, or Japan, and they find their way home with an internal GPS and the smell of their home river. And so they spend, you know, one to five years in the ocean and they go back to where they were born and then they uh, lay their eggs and clean gravel. And then at least for the, um, the salmon, uh, they all die. And so you have this amazing journey that connects the coast from the sort of ocean to these river systems. And some of these rivers are big. They might stretch for thousands of kilometers. And so you have these migrations literally moving the ocean upstream and yeah. moves it up into these inland communities and feeding birds and bears and people. So the life cycle is really intimately tied to their impacts and the benefits they provide and you imagine like you go to a small stream and it's just jammed full of salmon and it's hard to understand, like, how can it support this many fish? Um, but it's because it's the ocean, you know, the ocean is getting yeah. crammed into these tiny little habitats where they spawn and then die. And then the life cycle continues when those eggs overwinter and the juveniles emerge and then they rear in fresh waters for up to a couple of years. So, so they right overwinter now, in those yeah, same so streams. Yeah, they do. So right now, as we speak up and down the coast, there's, you know, millions, if not billions of tiny little fertilized salmon eggs in the gravel, um, you know, getting ready to emerge in a couple months. So they're essentially like the largest migration or mechanism of the ocean coming inland. Like they Either, bring it with yeah. them. They bring it with them. They, they're they bringing yeah. millions of pounds of fertilizers in their bodies and all this energy and um so they really, you know, make these systems alive. So salmon and deglaciation, mm. how do those two interact? What's what's going on there? Yeah, well, first of all, salmon evolved in sort of these systems of Western North America that have had a lot of glacial history. And so I think it is important for us to sort of keep that in our minds that salmon have sort of adapted to these dynamic glaciated watersheds where there might be glacier dams and sediments moving a lot and rivers changing direction. And so salmon 
um, can thrive in sort of glaciated systems. But as we know, glaciers are disappearing fast. And so that's posing both sort of challenges and opportunities for salmon. And so on the one hand, you know, glaciers are these amazing sort of ice cubes on in these mountains. And then on hot summer days, they keep the water running and they keep it running cool, which can help really sustain downstream ecosystems. On the other hand, work has found that in the systems that are created when glaciers retreat, salmon are finding these habitats. Salmon, you know, most of them find their way home, but some of them stray. And those strays seem like they find those new river systems pretty fast. And one work, you know, some work by some classic work by Sandy Milner back in the day in Glacier Bay found that within two decades of a stream appearing from under the ice now had, you know, 10 to 20,000 pink salmon in it. So that's happening. And so we have sort of glacier recession happening fast with human caused climate change. And then these sort of, you know, the risks and local benefits are sort of playing out for salmon. So is that return to the natal waters? That's so the randomness of that is, is that an evolutionary mechanism to basically deal with a changing landscape? Yeah, the thinking is, is that it, it is an evolutionary mechanism such that the parents aren't literally putting their eggs all in one basket yeah. and such that if a stream gets destroyed by a flood or a glacial outburst or a glacial dam or something like that, then they'll have some productivity from the fish that didn't come back there. And there's also the sort of benefit is that the productivity of fish that are sort of the colonizers could probably be quite high because the habitat isn't filled up yet. And so those sort of early arrivals might produce sort of really high production. One term that you all coined that I love is um, salmon accessible glaciers. Mm. Um, <laughs> what, what is yeah. a salmon accessible glacier? Yeah, that's we. Um, so there's, I think, we estimate about 46,000 glaciers within the range of salmon in Western North America. But a lot of those glaciers are sort of perched up high in mountains. And um, so those uh, aren't accessible to salmon. Yeah. And so salmon accessible glaciers are ones that are generally lower down in river systems, but not above barriers. They're not above super steep um, parts of streams that otherwise would block the salmon migration. And so those are those places where the salmon accessible glaciers, those might be the places that with glacial retreat come some local opportunities for salmon to sort of expand their range, even as climate change is harming salmon across, you know, vast areas. Yeah. So in places of sort of Southeast Alaska and sort of South Central Alaska and Northwestern BC, where the coast mountains sort of come right next to the ocean, that's where we're seeing a lot of the sort of hot spot of these salmon accessible glaciers. But that won't last, right? Like it, like that. It's not like the the rivers open back up; they're deglaciated, and salmon can be happy there permanently. Mm. Is there's yeah, also a timeline on the back end, right? Yeah, there is a timeline on the back end, and that's something that's we haven't explored too hard. To be honest, I have a hard time thinking about having accurate model predictions beyond 2100, just because I feel like yeah. there's so much uncertainty. I think the reality is that humanity, we know that there's urgent need for action on climate change. And so yeah. at some point we need to bend the curve um, yeah. or else everything is going to get too hot. Um, so I think it is important to sort of rep you know, consider that transience. And there, there are salmon populations that are healthy and thrive in non-glacial influence mm. systems, right? Yeah, for sure. I think that's, a um, you know, towards our Southern range, a lot of the salmon systems don't have glaciers and salmon are doing well. And so, yeah. uh, you know, these systems just need to hold their water and have some sources of cool water. Yeah. And the reality is that salmon are pretty good at adapting to hot water during the summer through migrating at a different time or going yeah. to different places. So, you know, I think if we give them some time and space to adapt, they will be able to do okay in many places. So who kicked off this research? Yeah, work by, led by Kara Pittman, who's a former PhD student in the lab, um, did this amazing analysis where she mapped out where glacier retreat will create new salmon habitat. And so she mapped out where the glaciers would be accessible to salmon and then use glacial forecast models to then project into the future under different scenarios of climate change uh, where those habitats would be located. And they are located in that sort of central southeast Alaska, northeast, northwestern BC region. 
So John, how does this look on the ground? Like what's it like to actually study salmon in deglaciating rivers? Yeah, so we we pair two approaches. We use a lot of remote sensing and sort of large scale forecast models. But then we also do a lot of the sort of boots on the ground, wet boot science in these landscapes, trying to understand how they're changing. And one of the places we work the most is in the Taku River. It's a transboundary watershed and the work of it being we're, the work we're doing is led by the Taku River First Nation in partnership with the University of Montana and the University of Washington in our group. Right now, this is what the glacier looks like. These are estimations done by Kara Pittman. In 2020s right now, and the glacier is all the way to here. And by 2030, the glacier is gonna be receded all the way to here. And Tulsaqua Lake is also estimated as a future salmon habitat. And that is just in there. And by 2050, the glacier will be receded all the way out to here, where we're actually standing right now. And you can see it's starting to recede and become a river right in front of us. And by 2100, this glacier will be receded past here, all the way past there, and up there. What are the management implications of deglaciated habitat? Mm -hmm. Because I'm guessing salmons are, salmon aren't the only ones with their eyes on that as an option. Yeah, I think this is one of the really important dimensions of the work we're doing is that, um, you know, as glacier retreat, there's opportunities for people to, and so mining companies in particular are looking to the retreating edges of glaciers for new mineral deposits. And a lot of this area of sort of uh, Southeast Alaska, Northern BC, it is a it's called the golden triangle and there's literally sort of a big gold rush going on here. And I think glacial retreats probably contributing to that. And so it raises these really important questions. Some of these questions are sort of societal slash policy questions about like, how do we want these future habitats to look? Do we want to mine them for gold or do we want to protect them for salmon futures? So I think that's a really important question that this work raises. And there's also really important policy questions. And for example, I think, you know, environmental policies that protect habitat from industries, they usually look at the world now, but they don't necessarily look at the world in the future. And so yeah. you think about, okay, you know, if, well, a mine might go through an environmental assessment and so they'll look to see where there's fish and then whether the mine poses risk to that fish habitat. But that's thinking about current day fish habitat. And yeah. if we fast forward, you know, a decade or two decades or more, um, within the lifespan of a mine and the lifespan of its impacts for certain, uh, it's not clear that environmental policies are protecting future habitat. And so that's one yeah. of the things that um, we've really sort of raised concern about is the need for environmental policies to take this sort of forward looking perspective given the pace of climate change. Yeah, I, I assume indigenous groups are pretty critical to this given their much, much deeper and longer history with these fish. Yeah, it, indigenous groups are really witnessing this change and thinking hard about how they can incorporate that into the stewardship of their land. And some of the most exciting um, leaders in this these ideas of sort of watershed stewardship is really um, these different indigenous groups. And they are uh, thinking about glacier retreat and they're also you know, developing new plans in new indigenous protected and conserved areas to project not just the current salmon habitat, but also future salmon habitat. So on the whole, um, if you were a salmon living off the coast of British Columbia or Alaska, um, would you want things to stay the way they are right now? Or would you be optimistic about this deglaciation future? Um, essentially, is it for the individual salmon today, is deglaciation mm -hmm. a good thing or is it a net still a net negative? Uh, that's a nuanced question. And so I'm just going to dig into it yeah. a little bit. It's a yeah. really important one. So um, I think I'd want things to stay the same, but mostly through the lens of climate change. And so, yeah. you know, with the climate warming comes deglaciation and with that comes warmer ocean temperatures. And, and that alone is a grave risk for salmon. And yeah. 
the sort of suitable habitats for many species are being pushed north in these years when there's ocean heat waves. Yeah. So that alone, I, I think, calls for um, moderation off this in this region. Um, you know, our work is really not saying at all that climate change is good for salmon. That's climate change poses a grave risk. What we're highlighting is that with these transformations, there's going to be sort of um, some local opportunities that we shouldn't ignore as well. And that we should think yeah. also about the policies that might be needed to um, ensure that if we want, that they could help the important salmon habitat into the future. Yeah, I really appreciate this. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate your time. Um, it was nice to catch up. And yeah, yeah. And thanks for the work you're doing. You're doing great stuff. It's good to yeah. connect. Yeah. Thanks. Have a good rest of your day. Yeah, take care. Bye. See ya.